Well, so good to have you with us, worshiping with us this morning. I do have just a couple of announcements, just in case you didn't see them as they went by, uh, because it's a change. The elders meeting will be on July 5th, which is a Tuesday. That's a little unusual. And then uh, the uh, potluck will be on July 10th, which also is a little bit different than usual. Not the first Sunday, but the second Sunday. Anyway, those two, as well as VBS, please make sure to mark your calendars for VBS. That's uh, July 25th through 29th, and I think that's all the announcements I have. Would you stand, please, for the call to worship? And then we'll sing together. All right, let's read it. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. That's Psalm 92. I lost it, but anyway, it's Psalm 92. <laughs> let's sing together. Make sure that you have your communion emblems. They're back there in the back and pick those up so that you might participate uh, during the uh, communion meditation. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, Nobody fall asleep now. <laughs> I want to talk briefly about messing around with simplicity. There are thousands of different kinds of hammers. I mean, there's, there's claw hammers, there, uh, there are curved claw hammers, there's Roofing hammers, there's straight claw hammers, there's ball peen hammers of all different sizes. There's all sorts of different kind of hammers. This is one of them. Now, I know one person recognized what it is. Lloyd came up and said, you know, you got this kind of hammer. 
Anybody know what it is? This is a fancy hammer. This is for putting in flooring, the kind of wood flooring that clips together. And it, it's got a soft head on it. Now, I'm not going to say anybody in here has a soft head, but <laughs> we keep messing with simplicity. Now, this congregation has it down pretty good, I think. The simplicity of communion. We don't do anything fancy. We, we uh, uh, partake together. We, but there's other churches out there. I mean, some of them even in dance to give communion, you know. There, there are those congregations. But the simplicity of these elements that we have We use unleavened bread, which is what Jesus had. It's very simple. No yeast. When the, the Jews were preparing for the, the, the Passover meal, they, they cleaned, they scrubbed their tables. They got down into all the little cracks to make sure there wasn't anything in there. They... they uh, any, any unleaven, any leavening agent in there, any kind of anything. They cleaned it, cleaned it, cleaned it, just to make sure they followed the rules. We, we take this unleavened bread to remind us of Christ's body that was given for us on the cross. Now, Jews, they, they did the unleavened bread because it was supposed to be something that could be fixed quickly as they departed from Egypt. It's something that they could put together very quickly and take with them. We do it because Jesus instructed us to do it. He told us in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Verse 24, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and take the bread. Father, I pray that you'll help us to remember the precious gift that you gave for us through your son's body. The simplicity of it all. Nothing fancy. Just simple bread without leavening. Reminding us of your son's broken body. And then he took the cup, most likely the last cup of the meal. In his case, it was wine, the fruit of the vine. And, and it, it, it reminds us of the, the color of blood, and this represents Christ's blood. It, it reminds us, uh, we can also see that it was a, or probably the best antiseptic they had. So it's, it's something, this cup is a, is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Father, you've blessed us. You've blessed us with these memorials of your son's body and son's blood. And we thank you. We thank you for loving us so much that you allowed your one and only son to die on that cross for us. What a precious gift. In your son's name I pray. This is our junior church dismissal song, but you can't be dismissed yet. You know why. <laughs> right up here. Since Jesus came into my heart, let's sing together.
I read a story a few years ago about a builder who was showing a house to a couple who had just moved in or were just moving into his city. Now, in their conversation, he invited them to attend church with him the next Sunday. And then he added, if you go and don't like it, I'll buy you a steak dinner next week. Well, that was too good a deal to pass up. So the couple went, and they liked it. And it wasn't long until they were both active in the life of that congregation. Now, maybe we can learn something from that. Most of us need to be bolder in sharing our faith. Now, I'm not suggesting we bribe people into coming to church, although I like that guy's idea. But I'm also concerned that we not become so obnoxious that we turn people off. But I do think that most of us need to, to be more aggressive in sharing what Jesus means to us. After all, Jesus told us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, those are our marching orders. And no Christian is exempt. As Christians, God expects us to share our faith. Now, with that in mind, the question is, how do we go about sharing our faith? How do we witness to the faith that is in our hearts? I suggest that there are four levels or four types of witnessing. And each one a little more intense or effective than the previous one. So you'll know there may be more, but these at least, these four. First, there is the silent witnessing. Now this is the person who says, I'm not very vocal about my faith. I just let my light shine. I win people by my lifestyle, which speaks for itself. Now, that sounds good. But the problem is that it seldom works by itself. When was the last time somebody came up to you and said, I've been watching you, and I'm so impressed. Can you tell me how to become a Christian? I have a feeling that's pretty rare for most of us. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans, the 10th chapter and the 17th verse, faith comes by hearing the message, not just by watching. And Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the good news not just demonstrate it. Now, the second level, the first, remember, is silent witnessing. The second level is opportunistic witnessing. I was worried that I was going to mess up that word, but <laughs> I think I did it right. The, this person will speak a word for Christ if an obvious opportunity arises. I mean, a relative may be having problems, or our neighbor loses a loved one, and this person may suggest, maybe you ought to try going to church. Or, I believe in life after death, don't you? The opportunistic witness is often worried about not appearing pushy or offending anyone. But if he has a chance, he will say something. Then there is the invitational 
witnessing. I think this will sound more familiar. The woman at the well, remember, in Samaria, was so impressed with Jesus that she raced back into town and invited everyone else she met to come and see the man who told her everything she had done. Well, that's the same kind of enthusiasm. Invite people to come to church with us and see what is going on. We invite them to Christmas programs, children's programs, to hear a guest speaker or a musical presentation or to some special event at the church. We invite them. And if the church is friendly and active, this can be a real effective aid in sharing our faith. For most people, it seems easier. Now think about this. For most people, it seems easier to talk with others about the church than about their personal faith. So probably the majority of Christian witnessing that takes place today occurs in this area. Now a fourth level of witnessing is the personal testimony. An individual tactfully but enthusiastically seeks to share with another what Christ and his church have meant to him or her personally. Your testimony does not have to be dramatic, but just a sharing of how Christ has made a difference in your life. But this kind of personal witnessing oftentimes is rare. Not many Christians have the courage or the ability to share their faith in a personal way. Now, it's at this point of my sermon, as I prepared it, I began thinking, now, what would I say? What could I tell about in my life to show what a difference Jesus has made in my life. I have thought about the time when I was five years old, almost six, in Tibet, when the bandits attacked our village, took our house, and all of us in the house prisoners. And I remember, I, as a child remembers, I remember very vividly what happened. I remember that as the night wore on and the bandits were preparing to flee out of town. They put a rope around my father's neck to hoist him up and then shoot him and leave him hanging there. And then that was sort of their normal practice. And then to kill everybody else in the house. And then how at the last moment somebody hollered stop and my father's life was saved. I, I still have part of that rope. How he was saved. And as a result, my mother, my sister, and I also lived through that night. Is that one? Or maybe I ought to talk about my father being killed in a plane crash so suddenly here in Oklahoma. And how I felt and what helped me in the weeks after that. Or maybe talk about mother and her 20 years of suffering from Alzheimer's as she gradually got to the place where she couldn't say a word and how all of that happened and what happened. God's blessed and helped me and many others in so many ways. I could share about that. And there's other things, too. But the point is, it's just not a matter of having a fancy or dramatic witness. It's just explaining how, in a tough part of your life, how God helped, how he strengthened, 
how he made it possible for you to go on. Yet whether it comes to crucial topics or like our faith in Christ or eternal life, too often we say nothing because we try to excuse ourselves by saying, I just don't know what to say. I've talked to a lot of you. I've heard what you've had to say, and I realize that we each one have our different points in life where God has really affected our feelings and our actions. In this troubled time, we need to step up to our level of witnessing. If you've been a silent witness, look for opportunities to speak up. If you've been a timid about your faith, become more enthusiastic about your inviting and share your personal testimony. But once you become an enthusiastic inviter or personal witness, you may encounter some of the same things, same kinds of experiences that the Apostle Paul did when he first started out. Most of you are familiar with the story of the Apostle Paul, how once he was the chief persecutor of the Christians. Later he wrote, and when they were put to death, I voted for their execution. But when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, his life was turned around. And he spent the rest of his life proclaiming his faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. The 13th chapter of Acts tells about Paul and Barnabas setting out on their first missionary journey. It says, I'm beginning with the fourth verse, the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salimus, they proclaimed the word of God at the Jewish synagogues. Now, I think it's worth noting that the first place they went on this missionary journey was to Cyprus, the very place where Barnabas had come from. You see, usually the best place to begin sharing your faith is among people you know. And they may not receive it very happily, may not be very receptive, but at least it's a starting place. So they went to Cyprus. Let's see how they were received as they gave their testimony about Jesus. Because we may experience something a little bit like this at times. First of all, they experience hostile opposition from a sorcerer named Elamus. Now remember, a sorcerer is one who calls on the powers of darkness to perform magic or supernatural tricks. Acts 13, verses 6 through 8, tells us, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul. Now, the proconsul is the governor, the chief official of that island. His name was Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, when you speak up for Jesus, you can expect opposition. The world thinks it's okay for you to call yourself a Christian and go to church when it's convenient for you. But when Christ changes your 
way of thinking and acting, people may get, well, uncomfortable. They see your beliefs as a threat to their habits, attitudes, and lifestyle. And people respond in all kinds of ways when they feel threatened. They might withdraw and give you the silent treatment. They might get angry or try to ridicule you. They may call you names. When you speak up for Jesus, you'll almost always experience some opposition. Bob Russell wrote, let me read what he wrote. I have a sister who works in a factory. Everybody knows she's a Christian. She's an intelligent believer, and most people respect her. In fact, people feel comfortable in coming to her for counsel when they have problems. But even though she is respected, she sometimes gets hassled about being a Christian. Occasionally, she has to work on Sunday. Recently, one man shouted, Hey, Rose, what's a nice girl like you doing working on Sunday? A good girl like you should be in Sunday school, not out here making money. And people laughed on the factory floor. Encouraged, this man said, let's sing a hymn and make Rose feel better. And he proceeded to sing in a mocking way. Jesus loves me. This I know. And everybody laughed. It's not easy being a Christian with people like that around. You see, Christianity is a threat to a society that is becoming increasingly pagan. So society puts pressure on us to dilute the message and pretend that being a Christian merely means that your name was on a church roll and that occasionally you show up on Sunday. That kind of Christianity poses no threat to anyone and the world is willing to tolerate them. But if we share the truth that Christianity is submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then people will oppose us. Peter wrote, If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now back on Cyprus, Paul had to confront Elimus. Acts 13, 9 through 11 tells us, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elmas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now, in reading the Bible, we find that the apostles often were able to perform miracles for the purpose of confirming their message. Usually those were miracles of healing. But here is an occasion when the miracle was just the opposite. The miracle was not for show, but to confirm that their message was from God. And through Paul, God gave a dramatic demonstration and confirmation that none could deny. So when you're opposed for standing up for the truth, don't cower, don't be obnoxious, but don't yield. 
the world is bold and unshamed of its sins. And a society that boasts of homosexuality, abortion, pornography, this is not a time to be spiritually faint of heart. The Bible says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now the wonderful thing is that God promises that when we share our faith, there will also be positive responses, not just opposition. The Bible says, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Now that was a metaphor, a picture, that the people of that day could easily understand. Look again at Paul and Barnabas. Sergius Paulus was an intelligent man, eager to hear and to learn answers to the questions that troubled him. He heard the teaching of Paul and Barnabas and was impressed. And then he saw the miracle that confirmed their words as being from God. God has declared, and this is in Isaiah, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. I heard this true story. A woman in her 30s asked to speak to the preacher privately. She told him of a sordid past of four marriages, sinful complications, and she asked, can I become a Christian? I'm so thankful for what I've learned here. If only I'd heard all of this earlier, it could have saved me from a lot of hurt. Thank you for teaching me from the Bible. It's changing my life. You know, nothing encourages a preacher like a positive response to the Word of God. So don't let threat of opposition prevent you from experiencing the joy of witnessing. There are few greater thrills than the satisfaction of knowing you have helped to win someone to Christ. Don't let someone's intelligence our wealth, our prominence, intimidate you. They have the same basic emotional and spiritual needs as everyone else. Paul Tillich, the philosopher, described three anxieties of modern man that no amount of wealth or prestige can resolve. He listed them as anxieties about death, about guilt, and about a purpose in life. And only Christ can resolve those anxieties and bring real peace. Paul shared the gospel with the proconsul and this leading intellectual and political figure on the island of Cyprus, and the proconsul responded very well. 
a preacher, I'm told, was invited to the home of a popular professional basketball player. This was in Kentucky. New newspapers featured the exploits of this athlete on their front pages, complete with stories about the huge salary he was making. He was a folk hero to his fans. And so the preacher nervously anticipated some of the difficult questions the athlete might ask. But as they talked, he discovered the questions the athlete asked were the same questions that everybody else asked, questions he had heard many times before. You see, our spiritual needs are similar. Some people may have more prestige, but they have the same problems we have. How can I keep my children from getting destroyed by drugs? How can I keep my marriage together? How can I find hope for life after death? Only Christ provides satisfying answers to these basic questions. In fact, as our world becomes more and more pagan, I believe the opportunities for Christians are increasing. People are asking, what's wrong? What is going on to our, in our world? We have rock stars blaspheming the cross, sports heroes on drugs, leading Hollywood figures are homosexual. Something is drastically wrong. What an opportunity to speak, to speak up for Christ. What a time to point out that as we battle, as battle lines are being drawn, it's time to choose sides. Some are willing to listen. Many are receptive to the truth, searching for the answers that only Christ can give. Sure, most of the news is about those who are blaspheming anything that has to do with Christ. But there are many others who see that and realize there must be something better than what they hear. Jesus said, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest now. A man entered the preacher's office unannounced. And the preacher knew from several sources that this man had lived a very worldly life. But he'd been attending church for the last three or four months. And he said, well, preacher, I've decided it's time to become a Christian. The preacher rejoiced with the man in this decision. And he began to share the scriptures about how to become a follower of Jesus. He pointed out our need to surrender our will to the Lordship of Christ and then be baptized into his name. That's what I wanted to know. And that's what I want to do, the man said. He was joyful, and so was the preacher. Well, after that conversation and arrangements for baptism were made, the preacher shook his hand as the man left and said, thank you for coming. You've made my day. The man responded, well, thanks to you and this church, you've made my life. There's no greater privilege than to share the gospel 
there's no greater thrill than to see people respond. And for those of you who have decisions that you need to make, there's no greater opportunity than today, right now. If you need to accept him as your Savior and your Lord, follow his example in baptism, won't you come? If you need as a Christian to make this congregation your church home, a place of service, won't you come? If you have some other need that we need to pray about, won't you come? We come as we stand and as we sing. mentioned during my sermon some of the, well, I guess you'd say dramatic things that are major things that have occurred in my life. But it isn't just the major things or dramatic things. What a comfort it is to know that I have a Savior. To know whether I live one more minute or another year, I have a Savior. Do you know that? If anyone needs, wants to talk to me, I'd be happy to talk to you and answer your questions and tell you more about Jesus if you like. I love him. He's meant so much to me over the years. I've been in so many hospital rooms, so many cemeteries, I've seen the difference it makes in the family, the loved ones around the one that I'm there to visit. It can make a difference in your life, too, if you don't yet know him as your Savior and your Lord. Oh, please be seated for a time of prayer. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.